first I'm going to tell you a little story. In September of 1999, Alshadeh Janison, the founder of Zipcar, returned from a trip to Germany with an idea that would revolutionize the car rental industry. And this idea was Zipcar, and that's the car sharing. And today we're going to discuss if it was zipped or get zapped after its recent acquisition by Avis. And zipping is good, and zapping is bad. <laughs> So, Danison decided to bring car sharing to the U.S., and car sharing is companies that provide short-term, on-demand use of private cars that are currently located and easily accessible to the subscribers. The cars are charged by the hour, and gas and insurance is included. Heels are hard to walk in, right? They look good, though. <laughs> jokes, friends, jokes. <laughs>
match up with the strengths of this company. So if we look at the rental industry, you can see there's four main types of consumers. There's those who are on business trips, as we talked about. There's those who are on vacations. There's those who need quick replacement vehicles because of mechanical failure. That's what enterprise tends to target. And uh, there's those for leisure use, which tends to be often a younger population. They need to go shopping quickly, or they want to take a short day trip. Tends to be more on the weekends. So that's a very different segment as well. And you can see the different qualities that appeal to these different populations. So for example, people on business trips care a lot about quality, not as much about price, because hey, their company's paying for it, who cares? Meanwhile, so people on leisure use are going to care more about price. Uh, people who want replacement cars are going to care a lot about convenience and availability, because if your car broke down, you don't necessarily care what car you're getting, you just need a car right now. So what Avis did is they look at this, and they see where we fit. Well, Avis has really high quality cars and customer service. Price isn't necessarily the best. So they really fit well with this business traveler sector. They started out at airports, and this is really what they focus on dealing with. Zipcar, meanwhile, targets a very different population. They target those younger, younger audience in the leisure use category. So for example, they have a really competitive price. And then you see down here, they have a lot of age flexibility, which means that on college campuses, when you're even 18, you can rent a car, which is unthinkable for something like Avis, where you can't rent until you're 25. So they really appeal to these specific two uh, types of people. But what does this mean? So they, because they're so differentiated in terms of their targets, it means they don't cannibalize each other in the industry. So if these two companies were to say merge, or one were to buy the other, it would mean that they wouldn't be stealing their own customers, they would be separated, and that would be beneficial. Yeah, so no cannibalization. So Avis and Zipcar both had a big problem. Avis' problem was that they catered to these businesses, and these business travelers often traveled on weekdays. Meanwhile, uh, Zipcar caters to the leisure users, tend to be a younger population, as I said, that travel a lot on weekends. So Avis had surplus vehicles on the weekends they weren't using. And the problem for Zipcar is that they weren't getting a lot of capital funding, and they didn't have the money necessary to, to keep up with the demand on weekends. And what this meant for them was that because they had high fixed costs, they weren't getting enough marginal revenue on each of their rentals out to compete. So you can see here the stock price for Zipcar. This is in 2011. As Christina mentioned, that was the first year they were even profitable. And they weren't very profitable. Their stock price is going down, 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 down. Not looking so good. They're a company that's growing, but at this point they weren't profitable. So Avis looked at this and they said, we need to be a, a player in this market of car sharing. And they took a look at Zipcar and saw that by purchasing Zipcar, they could create 50 to $70 million in annual synergies. So that means the cost would decrease, you can see here, I talked about the fact that they have surplus cars, they have us on the weekends, that they wouldn't need, uh, they could lend off the zip car eventually, so they could really maximize the production and help each other out. So this really was an economical match made in heaven. Or, if you're not sold by this, there's another way we can put it for you where you might understand better. And section B might be able to help me out with this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so on March 15th, 2013, Avis bought Zipcar for $500 million in cash. It was a deal that really made sense for both sides to maximize their assets. So this is the acquisition that was made. You can see the uh, heads of the two companies. You can see the red for Avis and Zipcar over there. The two companies were joining forces. And you can see here from 2013, this is actually six months after the acquisition, and Avis' stock price really started to rocket. So they were really taking advantage of the fact that they couldn't compete before because they weren't in that car sharing industry that Enterprise and Hertz were in, but after this, they had the biggest player in that industry, and they were doing really well because of it. Thanks, Eric. So everything that Eric, Booty, and Christina have mentioned make this sound like such an incredible deal, right guys? Yeah, yeah. But, 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 wait, hold up one second. Let's talk about a really important factor, culture. If you time travel to the first day of Sigum, one of our first cases was Southwest Airlines, and Professor Shaw taught us that case. And what we learned was all about culture, and what made Southwest's business so fantastic really 
started with the root of culture and everything that was ingrained in the company's DNA. What we saw was that they hired with the right attitude, and this transformed into fantastic, very effective teamwork. From there, you had such a quick turnaround time, and you had pilots, and you had flight attendants, and everyone working together to really make everything work at Southwest, and that was phenomenal. So other airlines, people like from United, wanted to copy this and wanted to replicate this model. But guess what? They failed. They failed. And it was terrible. They didn't echo the same sentiments and values and missions, and it just didn't align. So one of the biggest things was alignment. Were they aligned? And they were absolutely not. The key success factors, the HR practices and elements and the strategy, none of that was in sync. And so, now, looking at Avis and looking at Zipcar, you see that the companies are kind of similar to Southwest and United in the sense that United kind of had that white shoe culture, right? The top-down management, very traditional. And then you have Southwest. They're fun. They're fantastic. And they, you know, they're all about the right attitude. And Zipcar is kind of like that. And so we really need to monitor kind of the pulse of culture as we move forward to really see you know, how this will pan out and the success of that. So you guys are probably wondering, what is it like to work at Southwest or at Zipcar now, now post acquisition? Well, let's find out. These are testimonials and quotes that we pulled from employees that currently work there. As you can see, Zipcar really values its people as assets. So they really believe in them. And they love how their people share the same vision, the mission, the same values, and that transcends across the organization. So when they come to Southwest, when they come to Avis, they bring these missions and these values, and it's rooted and great in their DNA. And so what we see is that these folks are really excited. They're excited for Big Brother Avis to come in and provide all these resources. So one, deeper pockets, two, an international presence. And overall, all these resources really allow for accelerated growth and potential. But there are some concerns because of this, you know, the differences and the disparities in culture. So that's something that we continually need to monitor. So moving forward, we're going to talk about the industry outlook. Things are moving faster in the valley, and uh, things change, and there's just a quick and rapid pace. So we see that there's a large, there's a large opportunity in this industry. Frost and Sullivan, a business consulting firm, did a study. And then they found that in 2009, the revenue was 1.5 million to 2.5 million in the car sharing space. But then fast forward, let's go to 2016. In 2016, it skyrockets up to 3.3 billion. So as you can see, there's still a great deal of potential in all this untapped space. So we're very, very excited. And if you think about our generation, how did you guys used to buy songs? We used to buy them by the album. So I remember buying Spice Girl albums, and I would only listen to maybe three songs, and the rest of the ten, I just wouldn't listen to, honestly. But now, we have iTunes, and with iTunes, you can buy the exact songs you want to buy. So, why don't you do that with cars, right? So, you're going to run errands on Saturday, you don't need the car for the entire day, it takes two hours to, one, pick up your driveway, and two, buy groceries. Why do you need to run it for the entire day? You don't. So, number two, we're excited about innovations. So if you think about Uber and Lyft, these ride-sharing programs that are completely convenient and accessible at one touch of your smartphone, um, taxi services, that just spread and launched within the past year. And even Google's self-driving car down in Mountain View, right across the street, in September in the state of California, as you're driving on Highway 1, you'll look to your left, you'll look to the right, and you'll see a self-driving car next to you. That's so exciting because you, you don't know where the industry is going. So we'll definitely have to keep that in mind. And lastly, with labor and the price of gas fluctuations, this changes the market a little bit. So for example, if, the, if there's an increase in the price of labor, it's a little bit more expensive for you to ride an Uber, a Lyft, and a taxi, but it's also more expensive for them to pay their drivers, right? So this makes car sharing a lot more advantageous and a lot more exciting. You'll be the one providing your own labor, driving your own car, and that's good. It's cheaper. But if the price of gas goes up, it's not as hot. Because companies like Zipcar, you'll see they pay for the gas and the fuel. When you rent the car, all the costs are in there. So it really increases the cost for the company. And so sad face for Zipcar. But how do you face for rental car companies? 
because when you rent a car at the airport, you're responsible for the fuel when you return the vehicle. So with all these changes, in the, with all these upcoming changes in the future, these are all things that we really have to consider moving forward. But overall, we really do believe that Zipcar will thrive post-acquisition with Avis if we continue to monitor the culture and really find a way to overcome this cultural disparity. Thank you.